Hello, welcome to Penguin Classics On Air. This is Elder Roeder, Editorial Director for Penguin Classics. Today's program is on Paths of Glory, the World War I classic by Humphrey Cobb, which was the inspiration for Stanley Kubrick's acclaimed 1957 film. With us today is David Simon. Simon, a longtime journalist, author, and television producer, was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun for 13 years, before leaving the paper after the publication of his first book, Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets, which was later adapted as a television series. Simon is the creator and executive producer of the critically acclaimed HBO TV series, The Wire. His new HBO series is Treme. How did you come to read Paths of Glory by Humphrey Cobb? Well, I saw the movie first, like a lot of people, the Kubrick movie. I saw it in college. Uh, and being as I was in college, I probably didn't do the right thing and read the stay for the credits. I was probably on a date, you know, uh, going to the $2 movie at the Key Theater in College Park, Maryland. And, and uh, so I, I, was, I was really moved by the movie. I, I remember uh, it stayed with me for a long while, and I thought about it, and I talked about it with people. Um, and I just didn't know that it was based on a book. I'd missed that part of it until years later when I'd consumed a lot more Kubrick. I was reading an interview, and he talked about reading Cobb, and I realized, oh, my God, it was a book. And that's when I went back and found the copy. What struck you the most as a reader and as a writer about Cobb's writing style, and what particular scenes in the novel were the most powerful for you? Well, the first thing is uh, he was very spare and unsentimental. Um, Cobb, uh, by virtue of the fact that he had been on the Western Front, that this was really a, a work of great importance for him to get, to get this out, you could tell he was, he was very angry at what he'd seen of war um, and what he'd seen in World War I. And he, he nonetheless didn't succumb to the anger in a way that damaged the art. He, he, he sort of pulled that anger through the keyhole of a very, very good spare writing. And he told a story of modern war and of, of institutional imperative over, over individuality in a way that, that is very modern. You know, there's a lot of sentiment about war uh, in film and in literature. People set out to, to, to make a... Uh, an anti-authoritarian statement or an anti-war statement, and they end up in some way glorifying uh, the heroism even of a bad war. Because, I mean, you see it now with, with the sense of um, you want to exalt the fighting man because they are, in, in, in a fundamental way, being victimized by the whole process. Um, and Cobb was having none of it. He really wanted to express exactly how lives were misused in that uh, conflict that, that really began and was, and was the, the benchmark for the 20th century for all the horror that was going to come beyond. And uh, I remember reading it and thinking, this guy just will not give an inch. He's, he's really just about telling the truth. Uh, a couple scenes that I thought were so beautifully rendered. One is not so stark as, uh, as it is almost a sort of tragic comic, which is the marching and countermarching at the beginning of the book, they are uh, the regiment is marched, uh, the French regiment is marched away from the front for what they presume to be rest in the rain, miserable, past the old woman. They get to where they're going and they're told they have to go back in the line for the for the, for the assault that is to come. And the march countermarch, the misery involved, came right through the page. The misery, the wet, exhausted misery of those of those men. And then the other thing that I, I don't think I'll ever forget is um, just when you think that Cobb, his, his point of view is, is rigorously in the trenches and rigorously with the men, and he, he's not, you know, maybe he's writing this way because he's not capable of, of that moment where authors have to take that, 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 that moment and, and look back because he's being so clinical about the battle, about the, about the lost lives, and then about the uh, betrayal of the men by, by, the, by the command. You think for a moment that, you know, is he ever going to have that sort of omniscient moment that, that, that a writer's entitled to when they've made their case? And then it comes at you. He, he, he's, he's talking about the chateau where they have the trial and where they're going to do the execution uh, of, the, of the three men. And he, he, he takes a moment and, and he talks about all the great generals that had stayed there and dined there. And it really were, it was the architects of, of such horrible butchery uh, in Belgium and France in, in that war. You know, he's talking about General Haig. And there's a moment where he has his say as the best authors always do. You know, he's earned it. 
he gets the point and he and it's that jacques to, to to quote another author of you know and this is on you you know and, and it's when anger is earned and when it's not misspent it's a powerful thing in literature and and cobb waited for his moment uh, thought hard about his book and and i think it's one of the most important books politically about that war and about our the century to come because of it our penguin classics book club moderated by kathy gursky has discussed paths of glory this season one of the points of disagreement is whether or not paths of glory is anti-war or anti-military one reader suggested that the failings of the men in command show the failings that can happen in any bureaucracy but with the consequences being so much more severe what is your perspective on this i think cobb was very specifically writing against the idea of organized, mechanized, modern warfare. That it is an anti-war book from Cobb's point of view. Uh, and, and yet it is done with a, with, with a complete awareness of the institutional imperative and what that means to modern warfare. Um, and that human life is going to be worth less and less and less with each successive conflict. You know, that, that book, it, you know, Cobb knew nothing of thermonuclear war. He knew nothing of the atom bomb. He knew nothing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki or of, of Dresden or, or, or the firebombing of Tokyo or of carpet bombing in Vietnam. And yet the book anticipates it in its, in its treatment of what the institution, the military is, and, and the political are capable of in order to be self-sustaining during the crisis of war. It is entirely an anti-war book. And at the same time, you're right, and I think the book club's right, it also is a very clinical depiction of a bureaucracy in action. And that's what makes it an important political book. And that's the part that Kubrick seized on. You know, Kubrick, when he was asked about the film, said, and you know, they, they spoke of it as an anti-war film, he said, I didn't make an anti-war film, I made a, a, this is anti-authoritarian. That's the part that, that Kubrick seized upon and extrapolated, and in fact went beyond the book in some ways. And he created some story dynamic that actually didn't exist in the book, but made sense if you were watching it from a, Cold War era perspective in terms of the generals turning on each other and such. Kubrick was after another thing entirely, and yet the material was there for him. So I, I think regardless of where their target was, it's all there in the book. And you, you can look at either, you know, it's all true. I think, I think both sides of that book club discussion got it right. The novel's focus on the chain of command and the failures of a bureaucratic system is also a strong focus found throughout the storylines and characters in The Wire. What are some major correlations you could trace from Paths of Glory to The Wire? We borrowed one thing repeatedly from the book. At least I did in my head when I was, we'd be fashioning these scenes. Uh, whenever we were depicting the, uh, the human beings that were at, at the throttle of an institution, be it uh, a police commissioner and a deputy commissioner or a, a mayor and a challenger or a mayor and his chief of staff, or a school principal and uh, an area superintendent of schools, uh, or uh, an editor in chief and a managing editor. Whenever we were depicting the maneuver of of such characters, I always had in my head the Charles McCready and Adolf Maju characters from the film, uh, and the notion of why do you get to that horror? Why do you get to that decision that that under no circumstance could justify itself, and yet somehow manages to justify itself? because of your moment of, of personal necessity. I think we've all seen that in institutions, you know, and, and from our po political leaders and from our military leaders and from our school superintendents and police chiefs, where uh, the statistics say one thing and you manage to twist them until they say something else because you need them to say something else. The attack failed. You need to explain it. It wasn't my fault. It was somebody else's fault. The maneuver of bureaucracy, Cobb got that so well that once you read the book, you could you could really see it in any institution. So it was always good to revisit the French generals of Cobb's imagination, and 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 see uh, the rage and the ambition and the and the petulance and the vanity uh, that is at work, um, because that's 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 the nature of man, and it's certainly the nature of 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 leadership to indulge in that if it's not held to account, and. Certainly, the French army uh, at this moment in time was not going to be held to account. They were their own. They were their own argument. So I think that we borrowed and, and and we enjoyed it immensely. I mean, when you see Deputy Commissioner Rawls and Commissioner Burrell maneuvering with each other, 
um, really, it's it's an echo of the French generals that, that Cobb invented. <laughs> 